Hey, welcome to the Texas Legislature Update with David Blackman and Jason Modulin, the president of the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. Jason, how are you doing today at the end of this week? I'm good. I'm I'm excited for the end of the week and I'll <laughs> bet. Get, getting uh, getting a weekend in. I'll bet. I you know it was a week that uh, it seemed like the legislature didn't do anything but deal with. Uh, a variety of social issues, which we will not touch with a 10 foot, 10 foot <laughs> pole on this podcast. Um, so probably those, not. Those, a- those weeks tend to, uh, um, <laughs> uh, it's kind of like that duck on the water, you know, the, the feet are, uh, are moving pretty rapidly and it doesn't seem like anything's happening on, on top. So, uh, um, right. Uh, I did spend a lot of a lot of the week running around, going to see lots of different offices to kind of prepare for what's coming next. So um, budget coming next, um, uh, lots of items up in energy resources and and, and natural resources um, next week. Um, you know, there were there were a few discussions this week, so I'm sure we'll get into those. Good, good. But first, let's talk about uh, you know an important event in Washington. We had. Uh, the House passed HR one largely on a party line vote, um, and uh, of course, immediately the White House promised Joe Biden would veto it if it comes to his desk. But then Chuck Schumer said, "Well, it's not going to get to his desk, so it, it, because it's dead on arrival in the Senate." So, uh, where do we go from here? I mean, you know, maybe at least it's a conversation starter, huh? I, I sure hope it's a conversation starter. A- absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, while it was seemingly along party lines, let, let's compliment uh, that there were four Democrats that, that came across and voted for it, uh, two of which uh, Vicente Gonzalez and Henry Cuellar that uh, were, were part of the Texas delegation, certainly pro oil and gas Democrats. Um, uh, they voted for it. Um, uh, I don't want to pigeonhole them into uh, pro oil and gas or they're pro American energy. And so, uh, I right. was very happy to see them, uh, uh, come across and vote for that as it's been pointed out, uh, ad nauseum by, uh, not only oil and gas advocates, but also cleaning, uh, let me back up there. Uh, alternative energy advocates, uh, um, uh, have said that the permitting reform, uh, is necessary in order to uh, get some of the projections on wind and solar and batteries. Um, none of that occurs without uh, necessary permitting reform. And so um, hopefully it's a conversation starter. Uh, there was a component of permitting reform in HR1. Um, some of that is a is a non-starter for Democrats, uh, um, really concerned about um uh, chipping away at NEPA um, and, and really not wanting to to open that up. Um, maybe there are other areas of permitting reform that that uh, Senate Democrats can look at and, and come together with House uh, authors and and put something forward that really starts to move the needle on pipelines, on export facilities, but also these these transmission lines. Well, and and on mining. Uh, you know, I and, and a couple of points on on the permitting thing. I, I've talked to, I talked to everybody on my uh, Energy Question podcast from from all segments of the industry. I've talked to CEOs of battery companies and lithium companies and solar companies, in addition to oil and gas folks, and and even the CEO of a nuclear company. And every one of them, I think I've interviewed sixteen CEOs since last September. Every one of them brings up the need for permitting reform, regardless of which part of the industry, uh, the energy business that they're in. They all talk about how vital it is that we streamline permitting process. And you you talk about NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act. That is that law, which has, has done good things for the environment in the country, but the way it has been implemented from a regulatory process. It, it, it just holds up projects for years and years at a time uh, doing these environmental impact studies. And um, that applies to, to a wind farm just as it applies to an offshore drilling location. And, um, 
And so, you know, we can't, you're not going to have any kind of, of energy transition uh, if, if all these projects are held up for years at a time through this permitting project process. And I keep waiting. And, and the mining is also important because you have to have the energy minerals uh, that go into the batteries and the solar panels and the wind turbines. And um, I, I keep waiting for more Democrats than just four to, to wake up to that reality in the House. And of course, more Democrats than just Senator Joe Manchin to wake up to it in the Senate. Uh, because you, you guys, you can't have your energy transition uh, in the current permitting environment. You just can't. It's not going to work. And so that, that's my rant for today. No, no, no. I, uh, um, uh, I try to stay away from that transition word, too, and just uh, <laughs> uh, focus on addition. So, you know, we're, we're, we're hitting on all those uh, uh, third rail words that I try to stay away from. But, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, you're absolutely right that you would hope that there would be some leadership from the White House and, and from Senate Democrats to say, um, this is a, a great opportunity for us to capture uh, uh, some bipartisan agreement. And uh, there was a Wall Street Journal op-ed today saying, you know, that the president doesn't want bipartisanship. And, and that's uh, certainly frustrating um, yeah. because uh, <laughs> the, the first opportunity true. he had uh, was on uh, um, uh, not vetoing, uh, reigning in the Department of Labor um, on, on some of their in investment uh, uh, rules and and uh, kind of the over uh, overbearing or over reliance on kind of ESG mandates uh, in some of these investment houses. And now here's another opportunity, and he's already telegraphed uh, that he will absolutely veto it should it get to his desk. So um, yeah, that that's disappointing to see. Uh, at the same time. Like I said last week, very grateful for uh, House Republicans and leadership really making this the, the first and top priority uh, for Congress is is lowering those energy costs, securing uh, our, our energy resources here in the United States to promote those and and, and expand production of uh, and looking into the future. How do we uh, tackle mining? How do we tackle uh, some of these uh, mineral shortages that we have that are absolutely preventing uh, expanded use of batteries, expanded use of electricity, um, and, and, and in the process, lowering emissions. And I think that's, that's another area that just gets lost in this conversation is um, it's not really environmentalism. It's like dogma that we shouldn't have uh, oil and gas or minerals produced in this country, um, it has nothing to do with lowering overall emissions, doing it cleaner than the Chinese. And, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's baffling. Yeah, it's, it's baffling. It's frustrating. And it's, it's really counterproductive for the country, but, uh, what are you going to do? I guess there it is. Year now is an election <laughs> year. And so bipartisanship just can't happen anymore in Washington. And that's, yeah. that's a real problem for the country. Uh, so back to Austin. Let's let's go back to a nicer town, Austin. Um, <laughs> it, you know, as I mentioned up front, we you know it was a big big week for social issues, and that's a part of every session. And I'm not complaining about it uh, on either side. But uh, you know, did did anything happen related to any of this uh, these energy proposals we've been talking about? You know, like the the carbon capture legislation or Senate bill uh, six and seven. Absolutely. So yes, yes. Uh, let, let's stay with carbon first. So Senate natural resources and economic development um, had a hearing on Wednesday uh, to go over Senator Nichols carbon storage bill. We, we talked about this last week and really it's a very broad uh, uh, bill to try to capture um, uh, both the, the incentives, um, but also the regulatory structure in place. I think the authors of the bill, the Texas Association of Manufacturers, Texas Association of Business, Kim Council, and uh, Tex Texas Oil and Gas Association uh, uh, put forward a pretty thoughtful process um, uh, that was championed by Senator Nichols to think about how do we capture some of these projects and bring them to the state? 
um, uh, you would certainly recognize the players pretty quickly. It, it, it turned into kind of a landowner fight with the cattle raisers, and it, it looked like eminent domain uh, uh, fights of yore. You know, um, <laughs> uh, they they uh, came in and and uh, said that um, the sixty percent threshold for creating a unit um, was was. Uh, in essence, forced pooling, um, that you're, you're, uh, condemning the rights of that 40%, um, uh, based on the agreement of the 60. And so, uh, Senator Nichols said, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to raise that threshold. He raised it to, to 67%, um, uh, two thirds of, of the land mass. Um, you know, he, and he alluded to, we have higher thresholds in democracies for, uh, amending constitutions. We don't require a hundred percent, hundred percent. We, we never get agreement on things, right. but, but we do say, uh, 50 plus one is, is not sufficient, uh, when talking about property rights. And so we, we raised that threshold to, to 67%. Um, I was in an office this week and it actually sits on natural resources and, and they were getting a few call, phone calls from landowners and said, uh, and they were asking me about it. Well, where should we set this line? And, and I said, well, you, you have the obligation of either going somewhere in between 50 plus one and 100%. Um, 50 plus one, you can get projects done a lot faster. Let, let's be upfront and honest about that. That That is a quicker way to get projects done. 100% while you're protecting 100% of the of the surface estate in, in that process, um, uh, you'll never get a project done. Never. <laughs> you can ask Not every ever. landman. Uh, it will never occur um, because uh, if I can hold out and be that last 1%, uh, I, I can hold out forever uh, for, for a better agreement. And so um, where, where do you draw that line? I think Senator Nichols, uh, very, very smartly said, let's not go as low as some of the other states in the country. I want to be a little bit higher, um, but I'm not going to impose a, a 70, 75, 80% threshold uh, that will just simply delay projects uh, and have those uh, uh, not occur as quickly uh, as we're trying to attract to the, to the state. So, um, I, you know, it was a very long hearing. It actually went longer than the House State Affairs hearing, which was talking electricity, of which I was in. Um, uh, so very long day for, for the senators. And, and ultimately, um, uh, we'll see kind of where ongoing negotiations are in that process. Uh, the House Judiciary uh, also had a, a, a carbon bill. Uh, it was by Representative Darby, more dealing along the lines of, of liability and, and what types of uh, financial assurances need to be put in place uh, by these types of carbon storage projects. So that was taking place at the exact same time. So, you know, you had, you had the white hats from the cattle raisers kind of running back and forth and, uh, uh, and you had oil and gas and, and, uh, you know, manufacturers kind of running around everywhere. And, and then I spent my time in, uh, house state affairs, uh, kind of focused on on transmission um, and the need for more transmission lines, particularly in the Permian Basin. But it's a fast growth state. We got we got needs all over the state. Um, and, and then after they were done with transmission, then they got into market redesign, and and that was a pretty healthy conversation amongst the, it was, the, yeah. the representatives. Uh, with, with ultimately the, the headline from uh, Kerry Bivens, uh, the, the uh, independent market monitor, at, I don't know, about nine o'clock at night saying, I, I think there's been enough done to uh, this market uh, with the PCM kind of in the in the pipeline um, that there's not additional intervention that needs to take place. Um you know, a lot of people will quibble with that uh, uh, phrase, but um, uh, it, it was interesting to hear uh, that as she was kind of pressed by lawmakers as as what's best for consumers. Um, and, and so that was an interesting kind of uh, bluntness. Yeah, it might have been the lateness well, of the hour. <laughs> I hope it was. Yeah, because that's. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> 
I don't want to. So that was just email. Wednesday. I, I yeah, just, that was Wednesday. Yeah, that was just Wednesday. <laughs> I, I sure hope that uh, that uh, opinion doesn't prevail at the end of the day, or we're we're going to leave this session in the same boat we entered it, where where uh, reserve capacity is concerned, because uh, you know the PCM is fine, but it's not going to to generate the the level of additional capacity we need, and everybody knows it. I mean, let's be honest. Everyone yeah, it's what that. it's what we've talked about. You know, is is we're skating by the skin of our teeth, uh, and and it worked today. But how do we know it'll work right. tomorrow? Right. Uh, when you got twelve hundred Texas, twelve hundred people moving to Texas every day, um, and, and certainly not uh, not bringing their power with them. Ah, I I got to tell you that just that just really makes me angry to hear. Anyway. Um, I won't go off. Um, so what else? Uh, so we, we, you know, property tax, I know there was some progress in the house on property taxes as well this week, um, with a different idea on it all than, than what's, uh, what the Senate is working on. Yeah, it'll be very interesting just how they, uh, how they do this process if if it's uh ships passing in the night you know the senate lobs one over and the house <laughs> lobs theirs over and and you know then it's a stalemate for a while until uh somebody decides to pick up pick up the ball and run with it uh you know we've talked about senator Betancourt really taking point uh in, in the senate side although there are a bunch of authors on the on the senate property tax package uh, really trying to focus on raising the homestead exemption. Um, it, it is a uh, it is a lower dollar amount, um, but uh, more steady, longer term. Uh, probably a greater overall uh, benefit for Texans. Um, the the uh, House proposal is more focused on appraisal reform. Every homeowner. So let me. Uh, first set that caveat aside is that if, if this is a, if you're a, a renter, you, you don't necessarily uh, see the appeal in this, but for homeowners, um, that appraisal jumping up every year, um, uh, Houston Chronicle had a great op-ed today talking about 20% appraisal growth in the Houston area and compared it with 45% appraisal growth in the Austin area. Holy <laughs> um, and just, just unbelievable um, we do have that 10% appraisal cap on homesteads. There's no appraisal cap on, uh, on business property. Um, and so, or on, on additional residential property that is not a homestead. So think about renting and things of that nature. Um, the house says, let's put a 5% appraisal cap in place. Uh, that would certainly help, um, uh, property owners just to, to soften that blow, uh, every year when they see, the appraised value very high and you're on this 10 percent um uh you know treadmill where it's 10 percent climb every year to get to that appraised value and, and it, it never gets there um and so it's always this you know you you've got a baked in um appraisal creep as they call it uh every year uh so the house the house wants to tackle that because that's that's the phone calls that they hear about that's that's what gets people angry and coming to austin um, and so I think I think Chairman Meyer smartly is thinking about this. This is what our constituents are asking for. Let's let, let's try to address this issue. It's a little bit of a higher uh, uh, amount in, in the short term, um, uh, but potentially uh, lower in the long term. Um, uh, but there's some market distortions that come with that um, uh, because potentially then, uh, as we've seen in California, where they have a 1% appraisal cap, um, uh, you, do, you start to do weird things. You, you create trust, you transfer properties uh, all to avoid uh, reappraisal. Uh, you hold properties for a lot longer. Um, uh, and so that tends to make the realtors a little uh, skittish. Uh, they, they like to see some turnover, you know, and so um, uh, it'll be it'll be a fascinating kind of debate. Uh, it's starting to spill out into the uh, opinion editorial pages. Uh, and I would imagine um, it, that 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 healthy debate uh, uh, comes to the legislature at some point is, is how do we 
uh, how do we figure out how to do this? Uh, keeping in mind that the governor really started the conversation with, I want you to put at least half of um, the, the budget surplus towards property tax relief. Uh, uh, the Senate's accomplished that. Uh, the House has, has actually done a little bit more, uh, maybe a billion or two on top of what the Senate is doing. Um, so we'll see. Uh, uh, it, it's... <laughs> It hasn't hasn't quite come to a head yet. The House has taken their strategy. The Senate's taken theirs. The Senate voted their uh, bills out and, and over to the House. Uh, the House has has just voted it out of committee. It, it hasn't yet hit the floor on the House. You know, this it's an issue that uh, because there's no obvious middle ground, it's almost going to take the wisdom of Solomon to figure out where where the ultimate compromise at the end of the day comes on this issue in this session it's um uh, but it's a big deal and uh it's a big deal for everybody so it's you got to pay attention to it that's uh, right we were talking before we started you know next week is actually going to be a very busy week talk about what you see coming up next week yeah so uh it'll kick off with, with really house energy resources uh chairman goldman there in fort worth has, has set a very long agenda uh, from Monday, uh, covering a variety of issues, um, uh, largely around um, uh, Senate Bill Three and and opportunities um, to to relook at that legislation from last session dealing with Winter Storm Uri. Uh, did we do it right? Uh, are there some tweaks that could be made um, uh, that would that would make um, uh, compliance easier. Um, uh, and then on the flip side, there's others that, that want to push a little harder, um, uh, kind of dig into gas contracts, uh, maybe provide uh, some additional tools for utilities or, or generators uh, to have additional complaint processes at the, at the Railroad Commission. So That'll be a, a, a long and healthy debate on, on Monday afternoon um, uh, in House Energy Resources. Um, and then towards the end of the week, um, Thursday, uh, the House will take up uh, the budget, um, which uh, in years past has, has gone into the wee hours. Uh, it's unclear <laughs> just how, how late uh, uh, we'll go this year. Uh, Chairman Bonin, Greg Bonin, uh, out of the Friendswood area of Houston, is a uh, house appropriations chairman. Uh, he, he, he's a pretty efficient guy, uh, a brain surgeon, you know, so <laughs> the el elbows are in tight and, and he, he, he works efficiently. So, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see, um, uh, just how late they go. Um, uh, but, uh, that's, that's typically one of the first long nights in, in, in the Texas house. On that same day, uh, in the Senate side, uh, the Senate will be taking up uh, their energy bills, uh, Senate Bill 6 and 7, uh, and then a variety of other uh, uh, legislation uh, dealing with uh, the, the electric grid and, and um, electric generation. So uh, it, it, it'll be... Uh, It'll be a long day on Thursday, and and uh, we'll be uh, happy to get to Good Friday if we make it to Good Friday. Well, uh, sounds like an exciting week. Uh, I guess uh, since uh, next Friday's Good Friday, we ought to consider uh, recording this thing on Thursday, right? Um. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we could, we could probably swing a Thursday, uh, uh -huh. morning to, uh, but then, uh, by, by 10 o'clock, uh, it'll be 10 to, to very late in the evening. So, oh, right. um, yeah. okay. uh, so, so Friday works for me, uh, we'll do um, it uh, if it works for you, but, um, that way I can give you kind of the, the play by on, on what happened, if anything happened on, on, on budget, uh, as it relates to railroad commission or TCQ, uh, or the Public Utility Commission, for that matter. Yeah. Um, one of the bills that I was focused on this week was was on trying to find ways to add transmission uh, across the state. And, and uh, uh, SMP Global has has followed up a 2019 study with with another big study out of the Permian, uh, talking about growth there, certainly in in oil production, but also in the goals of companies to be more efficient, replace diesel generators uh, with uh, electric powered motors, um, not only from an efficiency standpoint, you don't have to run diesel uh, all around the basin, 
Uh, it's got higher uptime, uh, but then also they get the benefit of, of lower emissions uh, as part of that process. Right. Uh, S and P has has documented just a staggering growth that there is no possible way the existing transmission lines into the into the Permian Basin um, could meet. Um, and so, uh, as I said to to Chairman Hunter this week in State Affairs, we need your help. Uh, we, we we need some leadership from this committee trying to figure out how to expedite this process. Uh, part of that is is some some statutory changes that need to be made. Uh, the other part is is making sure that the Public Utility Commission is is adequately funded and has uh, the staff on hand to be able to process uh, these transmission line applications, do the work of going and having public hearings and and route uh, meetings uh, with, with landowners to make sure that, that those property rights are are, are protected and 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 honored. Um, but if they don't have the the adequate people, they look at the statute and the statute says, you can take up to a year to do this process. And so they say, absolutely. We will take up to a year to do that process and many times ask for an extension from the parties yeah. uh, in, in month 11. And so I had a meeting several weeks ago with with uh, some of the transmission and distribution utilities. And they said, on average, once we get into the permitting process, it takes five years. <laughs> Just You know how quickly oil and gas moves. Uh, and so if we're looking at uh, you know, a 2029, 2030 delivery of added transmission. That just, uh, that's, that's a killer. Crazy. So that's, that is a killer, man. And that, yeah. that, that issue has been lingering already for years. For a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, unaddressed. And yeah. So I mean, it's just another example why it's so important to have these regulatory agencies, agencies be properly staffed and funded. And uh, that's right. It's to to everyone's advantage, not not just you know uh, the regulated community, but everyone. And um, you know, it's it's just a never ending battle there in Washington. <laughs> I mean, Austin, yes. my God, <laughs> in Austin, yeah. Sorry, Austinites, I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> what else for the good of the order before we shut this thing down for this week? I think those are probably uh, uh, the big things. I was just looking through the, the hearings for Monday and, and didn't see any other major uh, items that, that, that we're tracking. Uh, so uh, lo looking forward to, to getting into energy resources on Monday and, and kind of digging in. Um, uh, and, and hopefully I'll have an update for you on carbon storage uh, next week if, if Senate Natural Excellent. Resources tweaks that a little bit and, and, and then moves it forward. Uh, certainly want to honor property rights in this state. Uh, uh, this is a this is a new territory. Uh, we don't currently have uh, carbon storage uh, as it relates to surface property rights. Uh, right. Typically carbon is just um, uh, tied to enhanced oil recovery and that's and that's dealing directly with mineral owners. Um, uh, not necessarily with surface owners right now, so uh, that's it's new territory, and and that's that's challenging for all parties to to kind of dig into and and figure out what's well, best there. Take, what's the, you think what's about the best how complicated policy. how complicated that is? That could take a decade to figure all that out and protect yeah, everyone's yeah. rights. And, and part of it is is requiring the railroad commission to adopt rules in that process. Yeah. Um, uh, and if they were to create a unit, um, uh, how would they message out to, to surface owners? Um, you typically don't have as divided an estate uh, um, uh, with the mineral estate um, as you do with surface. Uh, you, you've got fewer uh, contacts, but um, uh, it, it'll it'll be a challenge for them, uh, no question. And, and so the sooner that uh, legislation can pass and the commission can get started, uh, at the same time, we're still waiting on EPA to decide on primacy uh, right now. Uh, um, a, a carbon storage or a class six well uh, is, is bifurcated in a couple different places. You have to go to the Railroad Commission, then to TCEQ, then to the EPA. Um, and that EPA permit takes uh, uh, several years. Um, and so uh, if, if there can be some primacy uh, where that EPA delegation is entirely at the at the Railroad Commission. 
Uh, you might be able to do some do some things a little quicker. Uh, they have one other primacy application before Texas, uh, and that's Louisiana. Louisiana, um, and, yeah. and they haven't they haven't come back yet and, and determined um, uh, what they want to do on Louisiana. And so uh, we're 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 in kind of a holding pattern uh, uh, behind them. That Alicia? Nope. Uh, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> well, so anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, I you kind of, I, it kind of cut you off there. Uh, my sound went out for a second. Anyway, so yeah, you know, the, in Texas and Louisiana, the irony in all this primacy battle is Texas and Louisiana is where the vast majority of the opportunity for carbon capture and storage is in the United States, and uh, they're dealing with those two states last instead of first which mm -hmm. uh, sounds like a typical Washington, D.C., EPA kind of thing to do. So so anyway, with that, I'll stop mm -hmm. ranting and uh, say thank you for your time today, Jason. I really always enjoy this. And uh, thanks to all our listeners and, and viewers uh, for, for tuning in. And we'll talk to you all next week.